careful members to introduce themselves because uh, they can definitely do it better than I can. So they start with the show. Okay, start with the cash. No problem. Uh, my name is Rakesh Agarwal, and I run a software company here in Houston called Snapstream. Uh, we make software that lets people record lots of television and then search inside those shows. They're kind of like Google for TV. And we're how The Daily Show gets all of the TV clips for their, for their show, the White House, and a few hundred other customers. And uh, about four years ago, I started investing in startups. Been doing that for uh, invested now in about 100 companies, um, some through AngelList, uh, and many directly. I've had one uh, really nice exit. GM acquired a company I was a seed investor in for a billion dollars, a self driving car company. So that's my background uh, as an entrepreneur and an investor. I'm Keith Kruger of Red House Associates. Uh, we're a group of entrepreneurs that uh, become investors. Uh, my, my personal background is I started a company with the co-founders called Penta Consulting years ago. I mean, split the software out, a security software, and created a company called PentaSafe, which we sold to NIQ in 2002. The original consulting company was sold to a, another company called Vera Center, which sold to Sundar in 2007. In between that, we, we took the game book that uh, we learned from Doug Irwin and ran a pen site and started a company called Idera, which was uh, uh, originally a, a SQL Server tools company that ended up being a lot of IT management. Uh, they sold the TA Associates two years ago. So we've been uh, fortunate enough to work with a lot of great people. We've uh, bootstrapped companies. We've uh, funded many millions of dollars in the companies. And, we have some pretty good efforts, so I'm interested in this panel. This is close by Mark. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Brow. Um, right now, I don't do very much. <laughs> but in the past, I've uh, done six startups, one of which went public, the other five were fortunate to be acquired. I've made five movies. I'm currently chairman of four companies on the board of several more and uh, on the board of Cuba University. Yes, so that's a roster. My Sounds like you have a lot of free time. Uh, so I, I think you can get a sense of how lucky, lucky we all are today to hear uh, from three very successful entrepreneurs who, you know, turn to the other side. Uh, because I think the three of them offer an interesting perspective from being on both sides of the table. Um, and we were, the topic today is talking about the perspective of entrepreneurs but I had a conversation with Chip the other day, um, and he had this interesting perspective on four different types of investors. And when you started that, I thought you were going to say the four types of investors are friends and family and fools, right? Then you have your angel investors, and then you have institutional venture capitalists, and then my favorite source of money is your customers. Um, but you have a different take on that. I thought that would be an interesting place for us to start. Uh, okay, well. I actually had a take on the four types of angel investors, but essentially there are three kinds of risk capital that are at play, because beyond that you have banks and you have private equity and you have all those other people, asset lenders, so there's really not risk capital. And that's the entrepreneurs themselves, angels and venture capital. Entrepreneurs invest their own money in their own companies. Angels invest their own money in someone else's company. And VCs invest someone else's money in someone else's company. And uh, that group, the VCs, how many VCs in the room before I start insulting them? They're gone? Well, then I do have a great VC joke for you sometime in your time. Um, but the VC today has lost the V in the VC. Any one of you go to Silicon Valley or Boston and the first thing they will say to you when you present your deck is validate the business model and then come back. Where's the venturing in something that is already proven? So what has happened is that gap has been filled by the angel, in the United States particularly. That's why the entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem in the United States is so thriving, is because we have such a large angel community. Our angel community, our angel dollars, according to World Bank stats, equals the amount of venture dollars being put into the United States. The US is about 70% of the world's venture capital, which is 50 billion, so 35 billion is employed every year in VC money. 
And angels in the US deploy about 35 billion. Now, we get to your question. But I split the angel group. The VC group, we all understand to a certain extent, they're the bad guys, they're the vultures. The angels come in essentially four categories in my mind. And this is a take that you probably haven't heard before. So the first is the emotional angel. That's the angel that has dedicated to a cause. Somebody in the family got cancer, they're gonna go invest in a drug for cancer that somebody, a child has uh, diabetes, the diabetes thing is attracted to them, they'll put money to that. Then you have the affectionate angel. This is the angel that wants to invest with the son of a friend, or somebody in the network, or somebody that met in a conference, and they really like that young woman or that young man, and they say, I want to help that fellow. And their state of their company may be far earlier than what Han said, you've got to come to them. You know, they, I heard Juliana say that you've got to come fairly fully big. So the affectionate angel is probably the earliest stage angel of all. Then the third is the mercenary angel. And the mercenary angel is typically the angel that forms these networks like Han, like Halo, like all the other networks. Because they're in it. They invest in companies and get access. And they are re usually done in groups, and they don't do very large amounts. But as a group, they can get up to whatever that we get, 300, 400, 500. And the fourth is a super angel who by himself or herself writes checks of that size. And our goose group could qualify for that. So those are my four types of people. So with, with that in mind, and keeping in mind also that our audience are entrepreneurs in the capital, of the four, should you be targeting one or the other? And maybe just to kind of open it up to everyone else, what are the attributes of a good investor? What's the type of investor that you want to invest in? So since I was an entrepreneur, I, I involved, you know, reading through these uh, steps before. In fact, we're still pitching deals, even with our companies that we put money into. So we're on both sides of the table quite a bit. It's, it's just a constant thing. So you need to find someone who's interested in your company. Hopefully that's had experience in, in either your market or maybe a specific part that can help you in addition to the money. Uh, you know, you've heard the term smart money. I think that's really important, particularly with angel investors. Because the, we always look for our, our group at, at Red House, we don't have a fund. We invest together as if we did with one voice. But we're really trying to go into deals that we have a background in that we can help accelerate their business. And we can offer value on top of just money. Now, that doesn't mean we won't invest in something very passively, but in those cases, we need to know the team in some way, or we, we have maybe trust that the board or whoever they're working with, you know, it's just a capital thing for us. So I think when you're out there looking for someone to, to put money in your thing, it's important to find someone who's got experience that you need in addition to cash. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I look for in companies that, that I invest in is uh, an ability for me to make a difference in the outcome of that company having some sort of domain expertise uh, in, in what that company does. So, you know, so I, 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 uh, I pick companies out that way. Um, you know, one company that I invested in in 2012 was a, a payday loan company, a company that was using technology to disrupt the payday loan business. And I uh, have spent 10 years over the last 15 working in a manufacturing company that employs 700 people, 500 people on that are traditional quote unquote blue collar jobs. And I uh, was involved in a loan program that we had at that, at that company to these 500 blue collar workers. So I had some understanding of the kind of rates that they paid going out for payday loans and, and debt traps and things like that. So. Um, that's something that I look for, and uh, I, I know from feedback that I've gotten from entrepreneurs, it's something they look for as well. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a different angel investor in that I do my investing in maybe 20% of my time, 15% of my time, the rest of my time I run this software company. Uh, you know, he, you do this full time. Yeah, full time. Right. So, and I, I, uh, I, 
so maybe the criteria for an investor like me is is different. When I'm investing in a round, I'm not I'm not a uh, a really big check into the round. I think you know the I invest a lot through Y Combinator through this one one channel, and I also invest through through AngelList and. My, I think that the entrepreneurs view my role differently because you know, they understand that I'm not a full-time angel investor. It's not. It's something I consider, uh, but it's not something that's not what I do today. Um, so, I, you know, I think they look at a round, say a million-dollar round that they're raising, a seed round, and they look at it as you know maybe there are um, there are five or seven big checks, and then there are smaller. A bunch of smaller checks. My my check is typically a twenty five thousand dollar check into a company. So so I think that changes how you look at you know what the, the that uh, investor what you expect from them. So I, I've met all sorts of investors who had previous careers from all different domains: journalists, scientists, uh, investment bankers, obviously. Um, the four of us, we all have operational backgrounds. In your opinion, does having that operational background give you an advantage as an investor? And if so, what are those advantages? Maybe you can add on to maybe a disadvantage of, of taking money from an operator to an investor. Well, first of all, I think entrepreneurs make terrible investors, generally speaking, because the entrepreneur tends to be passionate, type A personality, and these people like to like. So you tend to go into deals because you like somebody, or you like their product, or you like where the market is, rather than do the very thorough analysis that Han does or that, that a VC might do. So having said that, if you do invest in the right company with the right team, entrepreneurs can be very effective partners to the entrepreneur that is actually running. The angel entrepreneur can be. Uh, because we come from the school of bloody noses. You know, we've been to that school, we've had our nose bloody, so we do know the mistakes that we've made. More important than our successes are the knowledge of the mistakes we've made that we can bring to the entrepreneur, particularly if the entrepreneur is willing to embrace it and, and not have the arrogance of, I know everything, I just need your money. So that's where I think the entrepreneur angel can be very, very useful. Uh, sit on boards, um, open up the Rolodex, we heard all of that in the previous session. Uh, make all the contacts, even help sell, help them exist. But in the end, uh, I think more entrepreneur angels fail at what they're doing because they like to like. Yeah, I'll add on to that. Um, we get very involved with, with our startup companies. Even to the point where you know we have hands-on developing a business plan, financial models, funding strategy, product roadmap. I mean, in some cases, we're working with them daily, at least early on, to get things ready, particularly when we're looking for funding. I think the, our biggest challenge, since we've run companies in the past, is we have to step back and we're trying not to run your deal, and that's sometimes very difficult for us because. We can clearly see what we think should be done sometimes, and the reality is, is we just have influence, just as any other investor would. I mean, they have a board position, which gives us a little bit more interaction, but we really have to step back and realize we have influence, and, and uh, we're not used to that. So uh, when, when you are picking your investor, particularly if it's an entrepreneur, past investor, you need to really dig into their personalities a little bit and make sure that you know what you're getting. I think a lot of our guys uh, that we've worked with, guys and women, is, is they're open to that at first, and then when they realize how hard just starting a company is, and, how, and we're on top of them on it, it over a while it, it gets a bit overwhelming. And some, most of the time it comes back full circle, though, they realize in a lot of cases, a lot of our experiences turned out to be correct. And uh, at that point, it's a bit eye-opening, and, and things move forward from there. Yeah, I think being an operator is an essential part of how I how I look at deals when I when I look at them. I invest in uh, in a lot of software companies, and one of the things that I do is uh, is I I spend a lot of time with the product and I interact with the team around their software product. I'll you know send them. 
lots of feedback on the product and see how they respond. I, I like to try different releases of a, of a company's product over time to, to understand you know, the cadence of, the, of, the, of their releases and their, and their updates to the product. And it's not always relevant in some cases. I can't try the product out, but like for example, the payday loan company, I went and like, applied for a payday loan um, through, this, through this site and uh, that was part of my, my own due diligence on the product. And, and you know, through that process, I, I uh, feel like I learn a lot about the makers behind the product, and that's part of what's important to me when I'm doing uh, doing my due diligence. Uber thing too, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I'm an investor. <laughs> yeah. I'm an investor in Uber through a through a fund that I'm an investor. In. So I'm not directly an investor in Uber, but I but I have an interest in Uber and. So I drove uh, for Lyft when they first came to Houston, because they actually came to Houston before, uh, before Uber did. They ended up launching at the same time. Uh, but I drove for, for Lyft in my Tesla for, for one night to get an idea of how the service worked. It was like, not the night they launched in Houston, but the night after that, on a Saturday night, uh, from like 10 p.m., I helped my wife put the kids to bed. I was like, all right, I'm going out. I'm driving Uber, and I took it like five rides. It turned out I knew uh, two two of the passengers that, uh, that I was driving. I got a, I got a message from uh, you guys know Hassan Hassan Panagi. I got a message from him on Monday. He's like, were you driving around town in your Tesla? I think you picked my wife up. And, like, and a bunch of our friends going clubbing. Uh, yeah. Are, are you driving today? So you yeah. I, I got you. I got you. Surge price. Uh, <laughs> what about friends? Um, you know, I, I, I just started my career as an investor, um, and, and I'd say I found that I would think that having had operational experience and I can better relate to the entrepreneurs who on the other side of the table, and that would give us an advantage. But also, you know, no one starts a business because they want to be in the limelight, but you're kind of thrust into the front, and people are looking to you to make decisions and to you to go to the meeting. And so I, I, I think it's refreshing that you've noted that, that it's hard for the investor you know, the entrepreneur turned investor to kind of be behind a curtain now. Um, and, and, but, you know, it, and sometimes I think that can make some investors a little bit overzealous. Um, and so my next question to you is, have you ever had a pain in the ass investor? And what is your advice for dealing with sort of an overzealous pain in the ass? Yeah, my, uh, my background, this hasn't been so much the overzealous investor, it's the person that put way too much money in a deal that they really weren't comfortable with and things went sour with the company. Sometimes it was some, a member of the, might have been an investor who was part of the team, who, who technically wasn't an accredited investor, but because some loopholes they were able to put money into it. And if they ended up leaving the company, then there were problems with that. They wanted their money back. You know, it doesn't work that way, depending on the deal. So. You know, you've got to be careful when you, whenever you uh, offer investment out to somebody. I'm, I'm working with a company right now, and we we believe we're oversubscribed in the money we're trying to get. But one individual, a friend of the founders, is is very excited about it and wants to put a significant amount of funding out. And he's asking us, "What what should I do?" I said, "Look, he's a buddy of yours. Don't know his history. You'll have to figure that out. But do you really want?" close family friend putting a significant amount of savings in your deal. In my history, when I've had deals that I was really excited about that I got all my buddies to put cash in, those were never the deals that went well. I've just learned that. So now when everyone says, hey, what's the new hot thing you're doing? Yeah, we're working on it, but uh, I'll let you know. So I, I, you don't want to add more emotion onto it that already exists, and it's a lot of emotion. So you need to be careful. I'm sure you have uh, pain in the neck uh, investors. Uh, I've had some, uh, fortunately, as the very first one that I did went public, so I didn't really need a lot of investors after that for the next four companies. <laughs> but the, the one that did go public had, well, he was a partner, a non-operating partner, and uh, I have to deal with him carefully. You know, the, the last panel talked about maintaining communication with your investors. And, and I found that being very data-driven and having a monthly update that went out to my 
investors that show the same metrics. These are the KPIs, these are the things that matter to our business, and showing them how we're turning towards our goal. You know, sometimes they'll be red, sometimes they'll be green. But I found that if we maintain that open dialogue and communication, and that we use data rather than fluff to kind of communicate, um, that it's not quiet or mute those capable of that investors. Um, not that I ever had any capable of investors. Um, but I also want to pick up on something from the last panel, and they, they kept using the phrase investment ready. Um, and so my question to you all is, what is the definition of investment ready? What is the right time to approach one of the three of you? For me, there is, it, it all depends. You know, it depends on which category you fall into. So you'll find uh, an idea with a PowerPoint presentation? Yes, have. And uh, some of the work, some of not. But again, you know, it depends on which category you fall into. Was that the emotional investor side of you? Was that the affectionate investor side of you? Uh, typically, those of us who have been entrepreneurs and come in, we tend not to be the mercenary investor, the mercenary angel, right? Just because we, we're too busy doing the other stuff. Um, though some of us do become members of angel networks, and that's when you become the mercenary angel. Um, I, I just think that it'd be nice to see a fully baked presentation, but by that time, uh, you're probably not going to be as effective and, and a partner to that entrepreneur as you might be at an early stage. What about you, Keith? Yeah, we'll go pretty early, depending on if we believe we have experience in the space, because then we can help. If it's something that we're not as comfortable with or it's outside of our expertise, then uh, it's going to have to be a long ways away. I mean, the, the great thing, I would say the good and bad thing about the cloud is with very minimal resources, you can go a long way these days. It used to be a lot more expensive when I was starting my first couple companies just to get any kind of traction or product development going at all. So we, we're expecting that. The, the key is we see a lot of deals. And you're competing against all those other things. So if we see something where the product's baked, maybe there's an alpha or a beta out there, and there's a client, especially if someone's paying money for it already, we're going to be very interested in that, regardless of our experience in that space. So those are the things you've got to compete against. Yeah, I think I think uh, when I'm investing in in software deals, uh, I first and foremost, uh, and this I think question question comes up in Houston a fair bit with software companies. I look for the ability for the team that I'm talking to to make the product. You know, sometimes you have folks with an idea, but oh, I've got to find my technical co-founder. Okay, I mean that's that's not the ability to go and go and build the product. I, I mentioned I invest through this thing called Y Combinator on the West Coast, and I mean that's I, I personally also have a bias towards very technical teams. That's part of what I invest in, what I look for in companies that I invest in is uh, people solving very hard technical problems that uh, where the technical team is more than in place. They are the founders typically of the companies that, that I invest in. But uh, I think a question that comes up in Houston a lot is this, you know, I don't have my technical co-founder yet, I have domain experience in a certain area. Uh, you know, if that's the case, you, you really need to go and you need to find a way to signal to, to an investor that you're serious, that you can go uh, build the, you can go, go get that technical talent, right? Hiring a third-party agency to build your app, maybe not a bad idea, but you know, I, I still, I need to see, if I'm investing in a software company, I need to see that there are people that are making software within your company. See, I, I actually have a really strong thought on that. And you know, looking at early stage deals, and you're right, Sean, like venture capital has lost the true meaning of venture. I think a lot of the early stage deals have fallen upon the angel investors, but we don't have a lot to go off of. So from my perspective, it's really about the team and the market opportunity they're going after. And with the right the right team, and usually that's that composition of the hacker, the hustler, and what the hipster. So the business guy, the tech guy, the world, and then the, the designer. Um, and the idea is that if they are passionate, um, if they're authentic to the problem that they're trying to solve, um, and there's a real market opportunity that they have validated in some way, um, that the right team would have the right opportunity and will figure out the solution. So what are your thoughts? I mean, this is one observation I have 
you know, from Houston versus after spending seven years in the Bay Area, there's a lot of really talented people out here, really great ideas, but the team seemed to be very lopsided towards, you know, really good business folks. You know, what are your thoughts on that, and how do we resolve that? Where, 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 are, the, where are the hackers in the team? Do you have this? Okay, you're in a very popular place. Yeah, so I've been on both sides. I've, I've had a lot of, in fact, I was a tech guy originally, but most of our um, our software tools, enterprise software, tends to be technical founders. And then we need help at build the business side of that. I'm now working with more business-related people that are looking for tech. And, you know, there's more resources now to, to go out and find uh, either a founder, at least get your product started than there used to be. So we're pushing them towards those avenues if we think they've got a good idea. You know, the last panel talked about getting involved with, with the investors, the angels, whatever the groups might be early on, well before you're ready to pitch. And this is when you can start asking questions. We'll sit down with anybody and talk with them. I'll sit down multiple times with someone who's looking for advice, especially if we're having coffee or lunch or something. But you only get that first time to pitch. So you better be ready for it. And we, we have a different tack when someone's pitching us versus when they're just asking for advice. And the trick is there to always ask advice while you're really pitching. And that was, and we still do that today. We'll go even to our old VC people and say, hey, we just started this thing or we just put money in this thing. We're not coming to you to pitch it, but we want to take you out for a beer and tell you about it. Or we're, we're in Austin this week, we want to stop by, and, 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 or next time you're in Houston. So there's a lot of ways to do this and to sort of uh, find that, that talent you need on both sides of the aisle. I think that, uh, that, that I, I'm in the same boat. I'll have early conversations with someone and get to know them because I find there to be something interesting about them. I think that they're they're driven, they're, they have, uh, they're thoughtful, they've, you know, evidence something to me that makes me want to want to spend some time with them. Uh, and I think that your interaction with investors is all about managing expectations, right? Don't don't you know be too eager to ask for money. Uh, you know, sometimes that's not the stage that you're at. And knowing, being self-aware enough to know what stage you're at is part of being you know being effective at, as a as a fundraiser. I hate to throw a little cold water on all of this because if you look at the stats, even the VC world with all of their analysts and uh, all of their thorough research and partner meetings, two out of ten companies succeed, eight out of ten fail. So again, you know, we can do all the analysis we want, we can look at all the fully baked presentations we want. The odds of that particular venture being successful are, if you just look at the broad, average two out of ten. Now, if you were a baseball player, you'd be in double A, maybe single A ball, if you were batting at that level. So, uh, my my thinking is that a lot of the like super angel people that I that, that, that the Goose Group, we tend to go with the gut and with the team more than we do with thorough analysis of the business plan, thorough analysis product or any of that stuff. And our batting average has been a little better than three to two out of ten. But I think that's been a little bit luck, a little bit because we write rather hard checks and um, and we've been able to get great CEO founders that have allowed these companies to be successful even when they may have been marginal at best. See but I, I think you bring up a great point by just talking about how hard investing in the early stage companies is and, and you're absolutely right. The venture capital model follows the power law portfolio theory. They're going to write off half of their investments, and roughly five percent of their deployed capital accounts for ninety percent of all the capital returns to their LPs. So they have to have that base. They have to have that twenty x, that forty x return to make the entire fund because they're writing off half of it. But what about the remaining? What about that other twenty percent? Where does the distribution fall? And maybe it falls within a two to five x uh, return on their money. So what's the profile of those companies? So most, what I'm trying to say is most venture-backed companies that have an exit, um, they're, they're not the huge Facebooks. They're five x returns. And that may bring 
the VCs will take 5x. The, but, uh, but, but they're shooting for 10x. But, but the, my, my whole point is this. Typically when there's like a 5x return, it's because there's a strategic that's acquiring the talent, the human capital, as well as the IP. And this is where I, as an investor, am trying to balance risk and reward. And I think when you don't have a technical co-founder and what you're building, software or technology is for what you do, you're putting yourself at a huge disadvantage and you're making your deal much more risky for the investor. So just keep that in mind as you're building out your team. That really, really matters, uh, not only for your own sake, but also for enabling you to raise capital. So, so I just want to share this with everyone that, uh, you know, I, I go to this, uh, so, so I've probably seen a thousand pitches, companies pitch at YC eight, over the eight, last four years, eight demo days, and I've evolved this system of taking notes during the presentations, and I make uh, five columns in a spreadsheet next to each company. The first thing is idea. I look at you know what what is the thesis of this business? What is what is the idea behind the company? Uh, the, the second thing I look at is I, I have a column for team. Who are the people? Are these the you know like to your point the right people to take this idea forward? Um, the third thing that I look at is traction. So what what evidence have they have they put together in their activity to date that proves that? You know, there's a business here that validates the idea. Uh, what, what traction do they have? And then, uh, what's the fourth? The fourth item is business model. Just, well, what, how exactly are they? So they're creating some value. How are they capturing that value back to, uh, back to their company? So th those may be, a, you know, one framework and simple framework in which uh, for you to look at, evaluate your own idea and see, you know, when you're talking to an investor, which of those boxes you can check and how they would look at you. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about this. I, I think you're working too hard. Um, yeah, you're being very strategic because most of your deals have come through Y Combinator. So they've already gone through a really great filter, right? Totally right. And, 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 yeah, that's and, true, absolutely. You know, just keeping our audience in mind as entrepreneurs looking to raise capital, but let's just spend a minute on incubators. And you know, incubators have really risen and, and for those of you don't know, when you join the UK, it's usually a three-month program, and in exchange for, what is it, anywhere between 4 to 10% equity in your business. And, and, and keep Station use is free, free everyone. Yeah. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. But it's not true. Right. And, and, but there's a great exchange of value. And I'll tell you all, straight up, I mean, we got accepted into the Facebook funding beta program, which no longer exists, but it was a JV between Facebook, Founders Fund, and um, uh, Excel. And and we basically, we didn't know what the hell we were doing until we went to this incubator program, and we learned so much, it completely turned our business around, and we were able to focus and be more data driven. And 12 months later, we were required. So to us, I mean, I'm a big proponent of, of incubators or accelerators. Um, so, you know, Keith, you effectively Red House is structured as, as an accelerator or incubator. And Rakesh, do you like to go through uh, those accelerators as you're filtering? So, uh, maybe share some thoughts. Yeah, in a way, I mean, we're, we don't really uh, uh, mark ourselves that way, but for those companies that need more than just money and they need our expertise and their systems to help accelerate their growth, in a way, we are an accelerator incubator program that's ongoing. It's not just a few months. We're, we're in it with them until there's some type of exit. And we do ask for some equity up front in addition to our capital that we put in as, as angels. And it's a form of consulting fee. And, and we can spend an awful lot of time with, with a company, and if we can't help them to an exit, we never see a dime. So we, we think it's very fair in what we're doing. For the companies a little bit farther along that don't need that help, you know, they, they're just looking for the cash. So in those cases, we will do that if we really like the deal, and, but we don't spend a lot of time with them because, they, one, they don't need it. Uh, we probably offer more advice than they, they want anyway. But um, our, our goal is to, whatever we get involved with, we want to help make them successful to some capacity. It just depends how much time and effort we're going to put in, you know, it's risk reward. Yeah, I think if there's an incubator that matches um, you, your idea, and your team, that uh, and, and and 
if it's something that can, uh, you know, you see as a value add to what you're doing, I think there, there, uh, there are a lot of great incubators and accelerators that are out there, and uh, and, and it may be worth it for you. I, uh, I've I've seen founders that have been that are really experienced that have had successful exits, you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Even, even founders like that go back and participate in incubators. So it's not that it's only inexperienced entrepreneurs that go through these accelerator programs. Uh, they, you have very experienced ones that do it as well, and they do it for the network that that incubator provides. Uh, that said, there also is an excess of incubators out there, right? I think there are, there's probably an accelerator for accelerators. Um, I'm not kidding. Um, and so, you know, I think I think you also need to look carefully at what value the an, an incubator or an accelerator provides, uh, and decide accordingly. Talk to other people that have been through the program to understand what they have to offer. There's a Houston company, maybe that they're on the agenda. Naki, or is, is one of the guys from Jay? Is he, is he going to be speaking? Was, was he in the book? No. Okay, okay, good. Well, you know, like he's been through, they have that, their company, Naki, has been through uh, two hardware accelerator programs. Uh, does anybody here have a ring doorbell? No? No, oh, really? Yeah, you've got a wrong With, you went to school with? Jamie. Oh, Jamie, yeah. So Jamie Simonoff is, is like one of the people that runs one of these hardware incubators, and he, he has one of the like coolest Internet of Things, most successful products they pitched on Shark Tank. So, you know, they were able to make connections there. These guys have connections to China where they get all these hardware companies can get their hardware products manufactured. So you have some really great value add accelerators that, that are out there. Uh, and you should you should totally look for those and try to take advantage of them if it matches what you're doing. So we only have a few minutes and I Wanted to open it up to the audience if y'all had any questions for our panel. Anybody? I had plenty more of you in the back. Uh, what are some of your uh, biggest failures and what did you learn from? So, you know, I think all of us have had failures of one kind or another. Mine tend to be the ones where I should have never got into it. It was an emotional thing. This is a cool consumer product. It seems to have a, 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 some type of uh, early acceptance. We had no idea what the market was, and we just got squashed and lost all our money very quickly. So I don't like to fail fast method, by the way, as an investor. So that's why we tend to stay in things that we know best, because whenever we go outside of that, unless we know who's running it, um, it's not successful. Yeah, I try to I try to avoid uh, the the feeling of, as an investor the feeling of fear of missing out, um, and I do chase things sometimes. Like if there's a deal and I really want to get into it, I'll I'll, I'll do do a lot to try to get into the deal. If it's oversubscribed, and I'll get other people to refer me into the entrepreneur, the people that I know. But uh, but generally speaking, I avoid the you know the, the feeling of fear of missing out usually. That's uh, you know a sign that I, I I'm being like emotional about something as opposed to being being rational. About something. When you talk about your exits, uh, specifically the timeline and what kind of returns you see there. So we had ten exits. Uh, typically, it's been five to ten times. Uh, my, my first one was much higher than that because we had very little money. It was all sweat equity. So. Uh, the timelines vary. I mean, everyone has this idea it's going to be three years and you're going to get this type of return. It tends to be much longer. We, we had some that have been a few months that were small deals. The larger ones have all taken five, ten, eight. When my year just went, that was a very large transaction. That was uh, 12 years. So it can be a long time. And, and we'll put anywhere from a few hundred thousand to you know a couple million in a deal but then we'll have to, to bring more money in to the size of it. Um, well uh, they vary. We the longest took eight years but that was a very small deal exited for about eight X on a small amount. Uh, typically three years, three to four. Uh, if you're in, in a 
in a company that's got some potential, or they die in three to four years, usually. Uh, the company that I took public went public after four and a half years, and that was, that was a totally different ball. Yeah, I think that it's it just runs the gamut. The, the one exit that I've had is, well, I've had two now, but one of the exits that I've had is an angel investor. Um, it was a rare exit that this company exited GM for a large sum, a billion dollars in, after two years of being founded. They had no revenue as a company. It was a really rare thing, and I have like no illusions that I'll see uh, any or many of that, those kind of investments again. Though, I mean, they, it's not that they, you know, that GM overpaid. I, I don't believe that they overpaid. It's just that this company threaded the needle in a really hot space, self-driving cars, and built just the right team, and they killed themselves building an amazing product. And like, it was just the perfect marriage. Um, I was also, through Angel Biz, an investor in Dollar Shave Club at the later stage, and just a really small amount of money, and I got a, got a check out of, uh, out of that through Angel Biz. That, that deal was probably a four-year deal, though I entered it two years ago. But yeah, I don't think there's any. I, my, my, generally, my time horizon is, um, you know, I'm investing in these companies for five to 10 years. That, that I don't expect to see a, a return sooner than that. If it happens, something happens sooner than that, that's great. But, you know, the, I see the investing, this kind of investing as a long-term, long-term thing. So we we are pretty much out of time, but I, I have to ask this one question. Um, because those of you that are thinking about raising capital, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be told no so many more times than you're told yes. And it's very emotional and it's a dreaming sort of thing. Um, my question to the three of you just to end. How should you respond to them? What, 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 is, what should you do when you're told no by your investor? Because usually it's not no. Usually it's not right now. So how do you turn that not right now into maybe well, it depends on who you're talking to. Some people come at you very aggressively. Some people are nice. Some people are sly and deceitful, just want to get rid of you. So you got to figure out who it is you're talking to. Uh, try to get an understanding of why you were told no. Pick yourself up and try it. You be Robert Bruce. Yeah, we usually, when we say no, we usually explain why. And, and why we're not interested at, at that time. And maybe we'll never be interested, but we offer advice. So the thing to do is, uh, you know, take the advice for what it's worth and see if you can use that on the next conversation. And by all means, come back and talk to us at some point. I mean, just because we said no on the business side doesn't mean we're not interested in hoping that you do well. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think good entrepreneurs are teachable, and when you're interacting with investors, that's one place where you, you need to be receptive to feedback. And, uh, I, you know, Keith said they always give a reason for the not investing. Um, I, I don't always because, you know, because I it might be something harsh, like I think it's a dumb idea. Um, <laughs> Uh, those, you know, a lot of times I won't get to the meeting stage on, on stuff like that, but sometimes I will, and and I also say like, hey, I could be wrong. I'm wrong. I'm wrong more than half the time for sure. Uh, and but I, the I really love entrepreneurs who will uh, diligently ask questions uh, that are more specific about, you know, the things that. They, they, they'll look for weaknesses in their own pitch and uh, probe me as an investor. It's not that I like getting feedback, I, I, I really do, but I'm just saying that there, there is a, uh, you know, nobody likes hearing negative, negative feedback. There's a, there's a certain level at which, you know, you have to hold back. So let me end on one thing for you guys. The one great thing about an entrepreneur that turns as an investor is we know how hard it is. You've been in your shoes, we you know. When you have nothing, just an idea, you're trying to get your team together, you're trying to get people interested, find customers, we remember that. That's something you never, ever forget. And I was always able to get great advice from people I've done before. And it was a sort of a pay it forward thing, the way I saw it. And I do the same thing now, and everybody that I've worked with in, in the past, and I hope, I hope in the future in this capacity does the same thing. 
And that is a great way to conclude. Thank you, brother.